This week on Quality Digest Live, can U.S. manufacturers navigate the skills gap and learn to thrive again? It's all on me. Uh, plus, uh, thoughts on the eclipse. Uh, you may have noticed that one. Mm -hmm. uh, technology and, uh, you know what? The human condition. Why not? That more when we come back. This episode of Quality Digest Live is sponsored by Hexagon Manufacturing Intelligence. Hexagon is shaping smart change by providing the confidence to increase production speed and productivity while enhancing product quality. And welcome back to Quality Digest Live for August 25th, 2017. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Mike Richmond, publisher of Quality Digest. Yep, and I'm Quality Digest Editor-in-Chief, Dirk Ducharme. And I think you can file this next story under, oops, wow, look what we just invented. <laughs> wow, <laughs> where'd that come from? <laughs> well, Army scientists and engineers uh, recently made uh, what's really kind of a ground-breaking discovery, an aluminum nanomaterial uh, of their own design that produces high amounts of energy when it comes in contact with water hmm. or any liquid containing water. Hmm. So during a, a, a material experimentation at the U.S. Army Research Lab, researchers saw a bubbling reaction when they added water to a na nano galvanic aluminum based power. And they weren't e really expecting that, so it was, you know, surprise. So <laughs> as they investigated, this was crazy. They found out that the water splits apart into hydrogen and oxygen when it comes in contact with the aluminum nanomaterial. Huh. I mean, think about it. Splitting off hydrogen atoms from water, that means yeah, power. Power, there you go. Hydrogen, sure, sure. power generation, yeah. uh, and some implications for uh, power and energy applications yeah, in the yeah. future. The hydrogen that is given off can be used as a fuel in a fuel cell, for instance. Uh, this is according to uh, Scott Grendahl, a materials engineer and a team leader. Uh, what they discovered is a mechanism for a rapid rapid, and that's the key word, really rapid, and spontaneous hydrolysis of water. What's unique about their discovery is that unlike other methods of splitting off hydrogen, which involve a catalyst, uh, elevated temperature, electricity, and some secret sauce, this doesn't require a catalyst, and it's fast. Researchers calculated that one kilogram of aluminum powder, 2.2 pounds, can produce 220 kilowatts of energy in three minutes. Wow. So that's room temperature, water, <laughs> 220 kilowatts of power in three minutes. Wow. And it, this doubles if you consider the amount of energy that's produced because this is a, an exothermic reaction. So that's a lot of power. Additionally, since the nanomaterial powder has the potential to be 3D hmm. printed, researchers envision future air and ground robots that can feed off their very structures and then self-destruct after the mission is completed. Remember, we're talking about the Army. Yeah, right, <laughs> So, exactly. so they're, they're thinking about that. Wow. Um, of course, uh, these are Army researchers, so their immediate thoughts are, you know, how can this help the Army? How can this help soldiers? So one idea might be to help recharge mobile devices for recon teams. All you need is some of this powder mm -hmm. and water, and there you got instant there you go. power. Yep. And as with all, th all things military, if this actually pans out as it's described, and there's still more research that has to be done, they got to publish their papers, people got to, you know, verify it and all that. This could obviously end up as a technology with civilian use, as most Army stuff does yeah. eventually. So this is really, I mean, this really pans out. This is really a crazy discovery. I mean, it's really pretty cool. I'm not sure I really understand the, the science behind it. You probably understand it. Well, it's, it's just that basically water is hydrogen and oxygen. oxygen yeah, yeah. And rather than going through a lot of, you know, other means that are to involved to hydrogen. extract it, yeah. this you just add water to al this aluminum powder and the water, it splits the water into hydrogen and oxygen, and then you siphon but off the hydrogen know, and use it. But I know we don't have a lot of time here, but, but it, so this, this powder was a fairly new discovery? The, the powder had just been th created? This is something that they created. The, okay, so I'm saying, it would seem like if, if this was a naturally occurring type no, of... No, no, it's not naturally occurring. No, okay. this is this is a, a special aluminum a nano special. A nano compound that they created. They created, And okay. then when they were testing it, 
they went, Boom. oh, hey, look at that. Wow. <laughs> but what if... what <laughs> if think somebody wasn't smoking your What mouth. if through the testing it was... What was that thing from that, that book? Um, the canine? No, the... Uh, the, the um, oh, gosh. Oh, well, I can't remember, even remember the author's name now. But... Uh, <laughs> that book, you know, the book, thing. That book, that thing with the thing. <laughs> yeah, with yeah, the thing. With yeah. the ice that went all over. Ice Nine, was that the thing? Oh, Ice Nine. Yeah. Right, right, right. Was that... What was that? Uh, who was I, the author? Oh, forget yeah, it. Yeah, forget we it. Know, we, you all know the guy. <laughs> you, I can't remember. You know but the you guy. Know. <laughs> the, the movie, the book, the thing. <laughs> Ice Nine. That was right. very interesting. All right. Well, also the news this week, a recent survey offers powerful evidence of the link between continuous improvement and exceptional financial performance. And that's the key takeaway from the study, the rising economic power of quality, how quality ensures growth and enhances profitability. The research was conducted by the American Society for Quality and Forbes Insights, and Forbes Insights is the research arm right. of, yep. of Forbes. In putting together the report, ASQ and Forbes interviewed 1,000 senior executives and 900 quality professionals from a wide variety of nations and sectors. Uh, digging into the results a little bit reveals the positive story for those who advocate for quality within their organizations. For example, 47% of respondents said that quality programs helped increase their organization's profitability. Approximately one in five said that growth exceeded 5% in the most recent year as a result of quality initiatives. So pretty, pretty sure. good, yeah. uh, 20% or so. On the flip side, respondents uh, identified a clear cost to poor quality and things like supplier problems, high employee turnover, and lack of leadership are both cause and effect of that. A whopping 84% of survey respondents so that issues of this nature negatively affect competitiveness for their companies. 20% stated that issues like these are costing their organizations more than 10% of their wow. total annual revenue. Wow, is right, 10% yeah. of their annual revenue, and that's not profit, that's revenue. Right. That's top line. <laughs> that's top line, yeah. That's a lot of money that can be tied to cost of poor quality. It's really, really incredible. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of other really interesting information in the report, including details on how collaboration and communication help foster quality improvements, how metrics are critical uh, and more data are needed, and how the ongoing digital transformation is driving new approaches to quality. So for more information on this report from ASQ and Forbes, check out the article below this video player screen or visit online at economicsofquality.org to download the full report and Kurt Vonnegut. Oh, Kurt Vonnegut, that's good. Well, I, I'm glad we got that. I, settled. I remembered halfway through that script, and I was like saying, uh, um, "It was like one br side of the brain was <laughs> like, reading that like script, great. the other side of the brain was like, Kurt, Chris, <laughs> Ice Chad, Man, Hydrogen, Kurt Vonnegut." So there you go, people. I know you're all waiting. For yeah. That. All right. Thank you. Wow. Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay. This um, I, I'm kind of excited about our next story here. Our top yep. most read story this week, and actually the top most read story for actually the past few weeks. Yeah. Uh, looking at our uh, readership numbers here, was from Tony Uphoff, uh, who's the president and CEO of Thomas Publishing Company. Uh, the article was Navigating the Skills Gap, How U.S. Manufacturing Can Thrive Again, and it did a great job of summarizing the decline of manufacturing in the U.S., not just in actual jobs, but maybe, I think, more importantly, the decline of positive perception of manufacturing. Uh, you know, we've talked about this before, manufacturing, you know, particularly with the beginning of the internet age, yeah. manufacturing, ooh, dirty fingernails kind of stuff, and it got kind of a bad rap. Yeah, sure. So if you couple that with the skills gap, you have a deficit of ready-to-go employees for today's manufacturing industry, and that has had a big impact. But there's a solution, several solutions actually, and here to talk about that with us is Tony Uphoff, President and CEO of Thomas Publishing Company. Hi Tony, thanks for joining us. Hey Dirk and Mike, thanks for having me on the show. Of All course. right, let's get right into it. Uh, in your article, you point to a 2015 report by Deloitte and the Manufacturing Institute that showed that while 3.4 million manufacturing jobs will be vacated by retiring baby boomers. Just 1.4 million of them will be filled by qualified candidates, and that leaves a de deficit uh, in the manufacturing space of about 2 million jobs. So how did we get here? Yeah, you know, it's, it's really remarkable. If you look at um, the post-war economy in the United States for the last 50 years, um, what started to happen is very successful custom manufacturing businesses in particular that were the lifeblood of the U.S. manufacturing economy. People came back and filled those jobs and there was, there was a, a reasonable economy that continued for many years after it. But then we started to see the future appeared to be primarily driven by the desire for a four-year degree. And our education system started to change 
emphasizing more four-year degree programs. And the children of a lot of these, or grandchildren, a lot of these folks who had run these very successful family businesses were creating an environment where their kids weren't prepared to take those businesses over. And as now we're seeing most of the, these baby boomers retire, there's an enormous skills gap. And we haven't filled that gap, really. The vocational schools that were really part of the two-year college degree program started to change their curriculum as well to more business-oriented curriculum. So we've created a, a huge gap. <clears throat> the irony of this is it's coming at a time as well where we're starting to see a rebound in U.S. manufacturing. So it's exacerbating this skills gap. And part of this, Tony, I think, is it maybe points to a, a sense of, of productivity. And productivity is something that, you know, we look at and say, that's great. You know, productivity is a wonderful thing in manufacturing. But, but many times what productivity means is, you know, you can do more with maybe with fewer employees. You know, certainly we've seen a lot of automation come in and, and reduce jobs, too. So is that a contributing uh, factor to some of this, too? Is this increase in productivity in U.S. manufacturing? I think it's a huge contributing factor. I think it's very popular for many people to assume that a lot of U.S. manufacturing jobs went offshore and went to other countries. The reality of it is some of that certainly did happen. There's evidence of that. But more importantly, it's the disruption of technology. You, you just nailed it. I mean, we've seen a tremendous influx of new technologies that have automated the factory floor, that have done you know, remarkable things to change the way manufacturing works. Now, at the same time, we think there's a huge opportunity there, though, because it doesn't do away with the need for skilled labor. If anything, what it's now creating is the skilled labor today and into the future is that part art, part science, because custom manufacturing is is really a, a, an artist's role, but it also has to understand technology today. So you're, you're melding those two skill sets. And you know, in, in your article, you, you point to um, STEM curriculum, uh, technical training, and uh, apprenticeships. Uh, that, that you say w would help restore U.S. manufacturing. And uh, you know, we could probably go on forever about any one of those. I think they're all important topics. But which of these is most critical uh, to you, do you think? And, and why is that? Boy, could I, could I choose 1A, 1B, 1C? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> on, on that, hey, hey, look, all kidding aside, I, I think they're all critically important. I, I think increasingly as we study the issue, and I'll give you a bit of perspective on how we look at this issue. So. For 120 years, Thomas has been the primary resource for product selection and supplier evaluation for the industrial markets. Today, every two seconds, somebody uses our thomasnet.com platform to do just that. We have over 500,000 suppliers that are on the platform. So we can look at this from a very interesting series of data-driven angles. And one of the things that we think is starting to happen is the best avenue could very well be in local apprenticeships because when we look across the 10,000 plus growing customers we have that are advertising, that are custom manufacturing companies, where they are seeing some success is local action to drive apprenticeships in their area. So there's, you know, STEM curriculum is fantastic to see and we certainly want to advocate for that. There's broader based programs, but I think in the spirit of what's gonna impact some of these manufacturing companies, it is programs and some could be subsidized that are gonna you know, help young people find a path in through paid apprenticeships programs and organized apprenticeship programs where they can learn that balance between art and science and technology that makes these jobs so attractive, but also the skills required to be successful in those types of jobs. So Tony, other than apprenticeships, of course apprenticeships are critically important, but are there other examples of things that you see that uh, maybe are working really well out there in the field that you think we should look at, at, at having more of? Well, I, I think to a great extent, and you're seeing this happening in some, some locales, and I think you touched on it earlier, there's, there's a, um, a small but very steady growing reframing, reimagining, rebranding, if you will, of what a manufacturing job is, right? So if you think of television programming today, shows like Mythbusters and you know, some of the, the, uh, the Bot Wars TV shows are actually celebrating to a great extent a bit of geekdom around manufacturing and working with your hands and building things. 
And we think we can see that there is particularly for the millennial generation, an interest in wanting to produce something. So almost an interesting counterbalance from knowledge work, which for a certain generation might be wildly unsatisfying to something that, boy, at the end of the day, end of the week, end of the month, I can physically see a product that I help to produce. So while it might sound kind of funny, not that we're advocating a marketing or branding around some of this, but I think highlighting how, how uh, satisfying these types of roles are. Um, and for a lot of young people as well, coming uh, out of an environment where perhaps they're not paying off a four-year university degree with student debt, but having some apprenticeship or job training where they can step in without uh, a lot of student debt and step into a job that pays well and that's a, you know, a, a long-term career, we think that the positioning around that is also uh, very attractive. So what we're seeing is companies are starting to showcase this. And I think the broader media is starting to catch on that while U.S. manufacturing is on a bit of a resurgence, part of the reason for that is I think people are discovering not only is this a great economic engine, it's actually a really satisfying career opportunity for people. And I guess finally, well, actually, I, I got two more questions. <laughs> we'll get to them real quick, hopefully. <laughs> uh, go, going back to apprenticeship programs just for, for, for a bit, so you mentioned local apprenticeship programs. Do these programs, are they typically coming from a, a, a manufacturer? A manufacturer will start up a, an apprenticeship program just for their company? Or are these more local initiatives that are generated by you know, uh, some sort of county office or uh, you know, a, a, a local vocational school or junior college? Where are these, where are these local apprenticeship programs coming from? All, all the above. Okay. So we're seeing companies just attack this on their own and set up, you know, local programs. We are seeing uh, local, um, I guess I'd think of this as city government institutions get involved in areas where they're helping to subsidize apprenticeship programs and or just simply helping to promote, you know, programs like apprenticeships. Um, it, it's happening at all levels. We emphasize that we believe that the path at a grassroots level is really important because you know, that, that's where we think that those things are gonna happen. Jobs are local by nature. I live in a community and I wanna work in that community and I wanna look for opportunities. So where we wanna see more of that is programs, whether it's subsidized by city or statewide uh, governmental institutions, and or associations are also studying, starting to step into this as well. Regional manufacturing associations, we think have done a tremendous job. We'd love to see them do even more because part of this is there's an interest, right? We can clearly see where the jobs are. This is one of those classic examples is we need the organizing mechanisms to match an interest in a job opportunity with the job itself, if that makes sense. So I think those local manufacturing associations can play a huge role in, in helping to create awareness around those apprenticeship programs and or in many cases help create a template so that local manufacturers can understand how to structure an apprenticeship program for their company. Okay, and, and, and finally, um, are we turning a corner, do you think? Do, in, in other words, do we seem to be funneling more people back into, ma back into manufacturing? Is it getting sexy again? Or, are, are people signing up for these apprenticeship programs? Are, are, we, are we starting to see an uptick? I, I, I think it, it's, there's no question we're starting to see an uptick. And, and I think um, it, it would not be a wild proclamation to say we're at the beginning of what I would think of as a renaissance in U.S. manufacturing. And I, and I mean that for two reasons. One is something you posed earlier is the disruptive nature of technology. We have a generation of people that grew up with many of these technologies. They take them for granted. It's intuitive to them. And when you combine an interest in wanting to learn about manufacturing and their, under, their digital natives, if you will, they're gonna take this in ways we haven't even dreamed of. And I think this rising interest in wanting to produce things that you can see and touch and feel, I, I think is gonna touch off a, really a remarkable uh, you know, uh, era. Many of the studies, some of which that you've mentioned, the Deloitte study, has noted a distinctive lift in the positive nature of U.S. manufacturing-based jobs with millennials. And that's irrefutable data. And we can see a lot of interest in our demographics as well. Uh, you know, if you look of our registered user base of about 500,000 users of ThomasNet, we've seen an enormous lift in the 18 to 35-year-old category over the last year. And our stretch goes all the way into 65 plus, 
But we take that as another positive sign that you're seeing this younger generation is very interested in these types of opportunities and they're clearly now in the workforce as evidenced by using platforms like thomasnet.com. All right, that's great. Well, uh, Tony Uphoff, president and CEO of Thomas Publishing Company and author of Navigating the Skills Gap, How U.S. Manufacturing Can Thrive Again. Uh, Tony, thanks for joining us. Mike and Dirk, thanks again. Really enjoyed it. Appreciate right. it. Thanks, Thank you. Tony. We'll uh, see you again. Really recommend you go out and read that, uh, read yeah, that article. It's really a good article. article. It's really good stuff. And you can yep. tell he's a very well-spoken guy, yep. and he writes, he writes as he talks. He writes as he talks. Few yep. people do, but he, yep. uh, yeah, he, very, very well a well-written article, and, uh, and I think you all should read it. Yep. Well, all of you may have uh, missed out on this, but we had a little eclipse earlier this week, yep. actually, from sea to shining sea here in the U.S. Uh, actually, a handful of people knew about it, and apparently three or four of them even, even checked it out. Three or four, <laughs> yeah, yeah, three three or four, or four people yeah. across the country <laughs> checked it out. As it turned out, one of those curious observers was the man to my right, right here, the, the co-anchor of the show, our, our very own Dirk Wright Ducharme. The day we all looked for the same thing is the name of the op-ed Dirk wrote in homage to this celestial event, in which, truth be told, of course, many millions of us here in the United States took a few moments to stop and taking something that only happens really about once in a lifetime. The piece appeared in yesterday's issue uh, of the Thursday Sift of Quality Digest's newsletter. Well, you know, Dirk, how can I possibly do justice to your article? I don't really know. <laughs> I mean, first of all, first thing I need to tell you all uh, is if you haven't read it, you need to go out and read it as soon as the show is over. I mean, Dirk, for all of his uh, geeky, tech crunchy weirdness, <laughs> and uh, believe me, he does have all that. He also happens to be, of all things, an artist. I mean, this is just a beautifully written and really thoughtful meditation on, yes, the eclipse, but on a heck of a lot more, too. So Derek, really, really nice job. Yeah, that. Really, really beautifully written piece. Thanks, for sure. Um, very insightful, uh, very, very, very well written, so check that one out. Um, you see, one of the key motifs that Dirk employs here uh, is all of us looking at an event together and, and seeing the same thing. I think the symbolism there is, is pretty clear. We don't really do that very much anymore, all of us, any of us, and when we do, it's a pretty powerful way to bond with one another and celebrate our, our common sense mm -hmm. of humanity, uh, which has really never been more important, I think, than it is right now. I think, Dirk, you probably would agree with that. Yeah, right? oh yeah. You, yeah. you wrote it, you yep. said it. And, and Dirk is an artist, yes, but he is also a technologist, a technocrat, if you will, and the other major part of the story, as he tells it, revolves around the impact of tech. Of course. In this case, it's very human impact, I yeah. think. And I think uh, you really nicely summed it up with this part of your commentary right near the end your piece where you wrote, this is a, the amazing thing about technology. It brings us closer together. We experience everything now as a group, whether we want to or not, <laughs> right? right. That's, that's really very true. But you know what else I is know what true? you had for breakfast. <laughs> you, can you smell that breath? Yeah. Yes, you do. No, I read it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wow. You tweeted it. <laughs> Granola. Don't tweet when you eat, people. <laughs> This is a key thing about the technology of today, this, this age that we're in. Don't, Don't we want to know. Well, what Dirk wrote there, um, this idea that technology brings us together, actually kind of runs counter to some of the conventional wisdom about the advances that we've witnessed in communications technology over the past decade or two. For example, when we think of the internet and all the little personal devices we use to access it, right, many of us would say that those innovations have made us more insular. Uh, but the immediacy of events of unfolding in real time online has created a feeling of shared humanity too, a sense of community that develops online, but hopefully transfers to flesh and blood experiences as well. As well. And no, I'm not just talking about Tinder. <laughs> I am kind of, but not really. Those flesh and blood experiences that start online, hey, hey, you know, hey, yes. Hey, hey. Well, we're all members of the human race, whether we like it or not, um, with a lot more drawing us together than pulling us apart. And I love that you made that point. You made that point very powerfully, bud. Uh -huh. I mean, that idea that we're really all one race of people and, and we're all uh, we're all together as yeah. one. And that's something like an eclipse, I mean, which again is a rare and brief moment in time, well, a couple of minutes we all yeah, really yeah. spent yeah. looking up at the sky. Um, you know, really allows us to look and find the same thing. It's an opportunity to remember and celebrate what we have in common and to share that, which again, makes us human. It's a powerful lesson, a meaningful one too. And I, I think that everyone that read it appreciated not only your sentiments, but really the way that you express them too. It all really came together perfectly. Oh, I mean, okay. it really was a piece that, you know, I don't want to laud you too much, but it was really this thing that it had a sense of inevitability to it when you read it. 
And with that said, I was surprised to hear you say the other day that, that wasn't at all your intention I when you started this op-ed. What, what, what did you think you were going to do with this? It when started you first off as a tech piece. Okay. It started off as a tech <laughs> your, piece. Your tech piece. It, it was just like, well, isn't this interesting? Here's this event that's happening in the United States. We haven't had a similar event for almost 100 years. Yeah. Uh, and now it's happening in the internet age. So everybody can, you know, they can, they can go on Google. They can find when it's at. They can find, you know, exactly how to get there. They can see the traffic. And also, California. California, 40% of our 40% of our energy comes from solar. What happens during a total solar <laughs> eclipse? For four minutes. <laughs> when, for, for, when, 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 you know, and actually, that, and, I, and I was going down that direction until I was writing the intro and I wrote the line about standing next to the telescope guy. <laughs> the guy who would normally be the weird guy, except now he's your best friend because he's got the telescope. And he knows what's and going he on. he knows what's going right. on. And once I started on that, I went, no, wait a minute. Yeah. No, this is cool. Think of all the cool people you meet when you go to this kind of event. I mean, it's like everybody from every walk of life, and you're there together. And looking I went, up at something And looking together. up at something. I went, yeah. oh, and I just threw away 70% of the yeah. thing and started from scratch. So that's really where it came from. But it was a, really went in a completely different direction. But that's a really powerful idea. The image that we all have a common experience that we're seeing at the same time. Right. In real time. Yeah. And we're out there together with people that we don't necessarily know. And we're looking up at it. We're saying, wow, it's really cool. And, and you're just as likely to see some bleeding heart liberal standing Absolutely. right next to his funny co cardboard glasses right next to a diehard NRA member, both looking at the same thing going, oh, wow, that's isn't cool. That cool. That's right. And you both <laughs> and say, and you that's both, cool. And you both talking to each other going, man, isn't that cool? Yeah. The guy's wearing his NRA t-shirt and you've got a tree hugger t-shirt. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just like, it's like, yeah. It's know? a cool thing. It's a cool thing. And you know, with that, I'm glad you actually went political <laughs> with that, Dirk, because <laughs> I wasn't. I, you set me oh, up perfectly. You, oh my gosh. For right here, for yeah. my, my off script that I have for you right All now. Right. Cause I wanted to jump off of what you wrote uh, again. Um, you're gonna jump off? <laughs> uh, you're, may, you may jump off when you hear this. Um, Cause it relates to your op-ed, um, okay. but again, in a political, kind of a political way. Um, so economically, for many companies, uh, 2017 has been a, been a pretty good year. Been a really good year for a lot of yeah. a lot of people. Stock market's up. Inflation is is neutral or down. Yeah. Uh, sales and profits are doing great. We were really really well for a lot of companies. And yet, personally, many people who are reaping the benefits of that, um, and they maybe will get a tax break as well. Will really reap the benefits of it personally. They may be politically opposed to some of what's going on. Some of what's what's made that happen. So my question to you it is, is this: <laughs> It's interesting. My question to you is this: When you say in your op-ed that it's great that we all can look in the same direction and, and see the same thing. Um, does that mean, do you think, does that mean you have to sacrifice for a to a certain extent your beliefs? I mean, what I mean by that is as business people, should we check our political beliefs at the door and embrace the bounties maybe that the administration is bringing us uh, for our companies and for ourselves too? Do you think that's fair? I think we do. <laughs> I think it's funny you mentioned this. Not too long ago, my wife and I, who are both Democrats, and she's really liberal, I'm just kind of maybe a little left of center, we're talking to our financial planner. Mm. Because, you know, we're, we're getting close to that <laughs> retirement yeah. age. And, uh, and uh, I, I'm joking with the financial planner, and, and we're going, well, you know, neither one of us are real fans of Trump. <laughs> but but yay, this is going to be awesome. <laughs> but yay, yay IRA. <laughs> you know, I mean, you do. I mean, you end up in that conflict because yeah. in, in the end, we all care about our, co sure. our, our pocketbooks. And so you may not like whoever happens to be in, in office, but if, some, if whoever's in office is doing something that has a positive effect on you, you kind of go with it. And how about for your companies? I mean, how and I think uh, the companies think the even same more. thing. Yeah, or even I more. Mean, I think company, and you know, many companies do. I mean, you can't tell me that uh, 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 you know those people who who, who uh, left um, the manufacturing council that you know that was set up recently right. out of protest to Trump, that at the same time they're kind of going, yeah, I do hope we get some tax breaks. Right. Of course. Of course they are. Of course they do. Well, you know, <laughs> I mean, there, there's, there. It's a complicated thing because when you're, when you're in a, a large industry and you're in a company that maybe is a large player in a large industry, you're in many ways uh, embedded with the government. I mean, you yeah. want the government to succeed so you can succeed. Sure. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I've got a minute, so uh, <laughs> you cannot answer this if you okay. want. Okay. Uh, this is controversial. <laughs> this I'm going to be really careful how I phrase this. All right. Uh, but All right. you know, I'm a history guy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in the 1930s and the 1940s. German industry, 
German manufacturers were, were a major part of world manufacturing, and they right. were a major part of the world economy. The success of the German economy in the 30s and in the 40s, until the war really started biting hard and, and changed it, um, and the war, of course, and then they, they lost the war at the end, it really changed it, um, was incredibly successful, mm -hmm. unbelievably successful, the most powerful economy in Europe by far. Many of those people, knew exactly what that government was doing. And I, I want to be really careful, I'm not drawing an analogy between <laughs> the German government in the 30s and 40s <laughs> right, and the right, government right, we right, have right. now. Right. I'm just making an analogy that many of those industrialists knew what was going on and right. knew it wasn't right, knew that they weren't supporters of the government, but they profited handsomely from right. it. Right. Should they have pushed back? Should they have not accepted that? I mean, it's a challenging analogy, I know, but it's a fair question to ask, yeah. I think. I, I, I think it depends on, on, on what it would be they're pushing back on. In that case, I mean, obviously we're looking at it, you know, year, you know, decades, sure. decades on. So we can look back and say, well, yeah, it was genocide. You're going to push back on genocide? Yeah. I mean, come on. But, but they didn't. But, but they, they didn't. But, they, but, but I, I would say, yeah, they should have. Now, if you, if you look at, you know, uh, you know, Stuff some did. I, I shouldn't say yeah. no. No did. Yeah, some some did. Some did. Um, but I think you know the pushback is what are you pushing back against? If you're pushing back against something like genocide, then yeah, I mean it's like I don't care what my company's going to do. I, this is obviously wrong. I mean this is really wrong. We should be doing something. We, we should be pushing back. If it's as you start to get further and further away from these really far out things, then I think it becomes a little, well, maybe you do, maybe you don't. <laughs> you know, if, 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 if you're against, if you're against uh, the Secretary of the Interior uh, diminishing the borders of national monuments, do you push back as a company? Well, is it a big deal? Well, it depends on your perspective. De also depends on your on your customers. And it, and depends, your customers on your, and it depends on your customers. Some of this right. is marketing. But it, it's a different, it, now it gets more nuanced because you're not talking about genocide. You're talking yeah. about, you know, a national mile. So they're gonna, they're gonna be taking more, you know, stuff out of the ground or they're gonna be, you know, isolating, you know, endangered species from yeah. their habitat or something, right? Right. It, now it becomes a little bit more, it's not as, oh, for lack of a better word, not as critical. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. But, it, but it's not the same thing, yeah. right? So in that case, I go, you know, it's up to the company yeah. and, and their customers. It, it's a different thing. It, it, but it's an interesting it's thought interesting experiment thought. because, no, I, I because it's a spectrum and, yeah. and, and it's a slippery yeah. slope on that yeah. spectrum too where you say, well, I'll accept that. All right, well, what do you accept? I mean, are you, are you a frog in the water where that water's getting, right. getting well, turned yeah. up slowly? I mean... Yeah. yeah, how far before you can't back out? Yeah, before yeah. you have to jump out of that water. I right. I don't know the answer either. Yeah. I, I'm throwing which, that at you because I'm, I'm curious Which may have been, by the way, that was kind of the uh, what commentators were saying about uh, the folks who left the manufacturing councils is they're looking, okay, I've got customers, and if I stay in this too long, maybe we've been it too long already, <laughs> maybe it's time to kind of yeah, get out of it because it may be to a point where we're in there too long and our, da our, our the damage to our company is done. And we don't want to be with that frog uh, and, and staying in too long, and then all, now we can't get out of it. Yeah, know? and, and yeah. you also have to balance out the ones, the people that maybe do support a lot of what the what the administration is doing. It's thirty five percent or so of, yeah. of the of the right. of the customer base for many many. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And it's like, well, we don't want to offend them either. So it's yeah. a really complicated little, like say, yeah. nuance is a perfect word you used, because that's really what it is. Ah, oh, Dirk, good job with that off script, man. I, I hope that wasn't too controversial, but I, I wanted I wanted to explore that with you. So thanks for doing that. All right, well that's we our show for the, the week. Eclipse. Yes, we talked about everything this show, man. We went from the eclipse to to, to everything. Yeah, that's okay. great. Controversy, you, you name it. All right, that is our show for the week. Before we go, of course, we want to thank our sponsor, Hexagon Manufacturing Intelligence, is proud to announce that new laser scanning technology is available for the portable Romer Absolute Arm with integrated scanner, the SI series. The new RS scanner offers completely new optics and electronics, delivering a major performance leap with a scan rate nearly 60% faster than the previous model. The new RS4 scanner introduces an ultra-wide laser line nearly double the width of its predecessor, which translates to a larger surface coverage and faster data collection. Uh, with a higher point resolution, Romer users can obtain a greater point cloud detail in significantly less time during a scanning session. The new Romer Absolute uh, Arm SI featuring the new RS4 scanner is available to order via local Hexagon Manufacturing Intelligence sales offices and dealers 
or for more information, click on the matter edges below or just to the right, as always, of this video player page. And thanks once again for joining us. And uh, a special thanks to Tony that, Uphoff that's right. of uh, Thomas. Thomas Company. Mm -hmm. um, again, read that article. Really good. Read Dirk's article. Really, really good. <laughs> sure, sure. Read, read my article. <laughs> read it all. Uh, read, read everything it all. on Quality <laughs> Digest five times. Just click every and then read them again. See down there, that's including right. the advertisers. <laughs> all right. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Have a good week. <laughs>